I'd like to welcome everybody today. Appreciate y'all coming. Uh, 2019 recruiting class is a wrap. 2020 recruiting class, the work has begun in earnest. Uh, really excited about this class, our first class. Uh, 13 uh, student athletes uh, signing, of course, uh, eight signed early in December and uh, five signed today. And really recruiting nowadays with the early signing period, it's kind of made today a little anticlimactic relative uh, to maybe what it used to be. But uh, I'd like to start off by, you know, thanking our staff, our assistant coaches who did a great job, our players who did a tremendous job of representing our program uh, during the recruiting weekends, and everyone involved in the JMU community uh, support from a support standpoint for the role they played. Uh, I think it says a lot about the brand uh, that's been created here, that there could be a coaching change days before the early signing date, and that we were able to hold together for the most part, uh, the recruiting class and add to it. So I think we addressed some needs. Uh, we had some needs on defense, both at defensive end linebacker and defensive backfield. We had some needs at running back. Uh, we feel like we addressed those. Uh, so we'll shift gears uh, after today and kind of get into the football part of it uh, a little bit more, you know, the, the meetings with the players, the coaches' meetings in preparation uh, for spring football. Uh, all in all, we uh, signed four players out of Virginia, four out of Maryland, two out of North Carolina, one South Carolina, Jersey, and Georgia. So uh, excited about these guys. They'll all have an opportunity uh, once they report. They'll be here for summer school on June the 10th. We'll start camp on August the 1st. And, uh, you know, the way it works nowadays with numbers the way they are, everybody really has an opportunity to make, make an impact, show what they can do once you go to August camp and you know, everything's earned, not given. So, you know, we're excited. Uh, we're excited to start spring football and, you know, uh, kind of develop our team, assess our needs coming out of spring ball and maybe add uh, from a recruiting standpoint, you know, after that. So I'll open it up to questions. Uh, let her rip. Coach, as far as being able to, to keep this, this class mostly intact, I know that was one of your primary responsibilities. Right. What was some of the feedback immediately you got from these recruits? And as you began to add a staff, the experienced mm -hmm. staff that you brought in, what were you right. hearing from these guys? Well, I, th I think, number one, we had pre-existing relationships with a lot of these players. Uh, you know, we had recruited them last spring in the fall uh, when there was a change here. Uh, we were very active in the recruiting process with a lot of them. Uh, I think those relationships really benefited us. Uh, as we got closer to the early signing period. Uh, we honored all the commitments uh, made by the institution and the previous coaching staff. I'd also like to at least uh, recognize, you know, Coach Houston and his staff for their efforts putting this class together. You know, there's a lot of quality players, we, we believe, in this class. And, you know, a lot of this work was done by the prior staff, uh, you know, up until December. So the feedback we got right away was uh, obviously there's been a great brand established here, a tremendous tradition. It's a super place to go to school and be a student athlete, particularly a football player. With the JMU Nation, the fan support, the facilities, uh, our academic reputation, etc. So really it, it was very positive. And there were very few battles, to be honest with you, recruiting battles. Uh, you know, we were able to bring uh, the, the entire class back for a uh, official visit in January because of the coaching change. That's a, a relatively new rule. So these guys got back together, reestablished the relationships they had developed previously, and, and I thought that was a really good thing. R running back and defensive line is, is where you added the most. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you kind of assess those two positions and yeah. what you guys did there? Well, you know, at defensive end, we've got three seniors on the current team, seniors uh, next fall. So we needed to bring some, some people in that could not only compete uh, this fall, but also uh, be ready to step in, you know, in the future. And, uh, you know, Corey, Coach Heatherman, our defensive coordinator, he likes to play a lot of people up front. He likes to slide ends into tackle and pa passing situations. So, you know, we're excited about that group and their potential opportunity to make an impact. Um, from a running back standpoint, 
when I was uh, hired, there were two running backs on scholarship in the program. We'd lost our top three running backs uh, from last season. So I thought it was important to build not only depth, but competition at that position. And that's a position where I don't think you can ever have enough running backs, uh, you know, when you look at them from a durability standpoint. So we're very pleased with the people we got, and I'm really excited to see what they all can do once we start practice in August. Coach, what was it like recruiting with the James Madison name? This is your first recruiting class where you got mm -hmm. to go out there and pitch JMU to recruits. Yeah. How different was that maybe from different stops you've had in your career? Well, you know, I think it's a great sale, and uh, it opens a lot of doors, and, and it, it'll shut doors in your favor also uh, very quickly. So I, I think from my standpoint, maybe the biggest thing I wrestled with was when I came in, uh, the numbers were a little bit tight. And uh, there were players available that wanted to come. And, uh, you know, then you have to factor in a lot of different multiples in terms of, you know, what's your roster going to look like at the end of April uh, after spring ball uh, because generally, you know, the roster management's a little bit of a fluid situation. So, you know, where there may be a couple guys that uh, we could have signed today, if I had to do it all over again, uh, you know, maybe one or two perhaps. Uh, so, you know, I think when you're at a place like this, you're into more of a selection mode. Uh, so it puts a premium on evaluation and taking the right people. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things, obviously, that are important to me. Uh, I put a big premium on kind of character, you know, passion, intelligence, dependability. I think there's a lot of good players out there, uh, you know, that are position-specific criteria. But, uh, you know, it's all about selecting the right people, and that goes when you're hiring coaches or when you're recruiting. Uh, you, you've got a pretty good trio from the same high school and good counsel. Uh, what about them stands out, and then, you know, for them to be able to, you know, they, they must be pretty excited to continue their careers here at JMU. Yeah, uh, you know, I've, I was really uh, pleased, uh, you know, that that league they play in up there is almost like the SEC of high school football. Uh, a lot of Division I signees at the FBS and FCS level. Uh, Good Counsel's got a great reputation. Uh, all three of those guys, you know, are quality players. I think they are all uh, have the potential to make an impact, uh, you know, next fall. And, uh, you know, hopefully that's a pipeline not only in that school but in that conference that we can kind of continue. I think when you look at recruiting, the state of Virginia, obviously, is a great recruiting base. Uh, I think there's a lot of FCS type of prospects in this state. I think that also gives you the ability to attract quality walk-ons uh, into your program, maybe break a few scholarships up, which we did in this group. Uh, and then you look at Maryland, which is a border state, and North Carolina. And then, you, you know, you move up to New Jersey, Pennsylvania. But when you look at Virginia, Maryland, uh, those two places in particular, and the state of North Carolina. I mean, 80% of your players need to come from those three places. Coach, do you anticipate maybe some of these guys changing positions? Have you evaluated to that level yet of what they might be when they get here? I think some of these skill guys uh, probably are capable of playing on both sides of the ball. You know, when you look at a guy like Jordan White, I think he could be a terrific receiver, but we have no intention of moving him. Uh, Kevin Curry Jr. was a late add uh, to our class. I think could excel on both sides of the ball. He'll start out at wide receiver. Um, you know, we've made one or two roster changes on, on the current roster, and uh, but for, I think for the most part, the positions that you see that uh, these guys are listed at today are will probably be their home for the next four or five years. With, with, with kind of getting into the state of Maryland, your staff has, has ties to, to that state, and you have guys that have recruited that area before. Not only with this class, do you see it kind of being a big state for you guys uh, in the next in the coming years? Well, yeah, but I think our state is still the most important state, and uh, you know I think our brand sells itself. And if you have uh, quality people and quality recruiters that do a professional job, uh, the brand is going to sell itself in the state. Obviously, there's some really strong recruiting pockets in Virginia, and we want to continue to dominate this state at our level and compete with FBS programs also for recruits. I think Maryland is a state maybe we can dig into a little deeper, 
perhaps, uh, not that they didn't in the past, but I think the potential to attract a couple more guys is there. And, uh, you know, there's just there's a lot of players there. All right, there we go. Uh, Coach, you talked a little bit already the defensive line and running back. Aside from the specifics of that, is that just kind of indicative of your philosophy as a coach to have a lot of physical guys who can dominate on the offensive side of the ball, running the ball, and also trying to stop the run defensively? Well, <laughs> I think being physical and fast, uh, you know, when you watch national championship teams play on TV, Super Bowl winning teams, you know, they're physical, fast teams. And uh, so, you know, defensively, you know, it all starts up front with the ability to stop the run and put pressure on the quarterback and disrupt his rhythm. Uh, you know, the better your pass rush, the less time the quarterback has to stand back there, the better your coverage is going to be. From an offensive standpoint, your ability to run the football, you know, the offensive line probably is the most important unit on the, on the football team. They can dictate the tempo of the game, and if, you, you know, if you're having success running the football, it's going to open up a whole lot of other things in the air. So, uh, you know, we were really pleased with the defensive ends and the linebackers and the DBs we were able to recruit, and I think the three running backs we got are top-notch guys. We think all these guys are top-notch guys, but now they're going to come in and compete with a bunch of other top-notch guys. You know, and the cream rises to the top. And then there's a lot of intangible things that go into developing to your fullest potential. And that's why it's really important, I think. You know, I'm a big guy. When we're, when we're recruiting people, I want to look at that transcript. You know, I want to see what he did in ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. I want to see how many absences are on that transcript, et cetera, et cetera. Because I think those are telling signs uh, in terms of what you're getting and kind of the habits that, you know, that prospect may have. As, as he enters your program. So, you know, choices and decisions, habits, thoughts, and priorities, you know, go a long way in helping people realize, you know, their fullest potential, and that's what it's all about. I mean, all these games, when you play against good teams, come down to two or three plays. So the margin for error is about like that. So having guys that are dependable, you know, in consistency and performance day in, day out, that perform like that. And those are usually the guys that go to class every day, make good grades, all right? They're not on your list. And, you know, that's what we're looking for here. Coach, you've already mentioned that you're starting to work in the 2020 uh, schedule or 2020 uh, recruiting. Mm -hmm. As you've gone through this first year uh, with uh, the early signing period and the, the new rules for the red shirts, how does that affect the planning, the timing of everything that you do in the recruiting world? Well, I think right now, you know, we're just trying to identify and evaluate who the potential prospects are. Uh, you know, for us, and it's early, and, and we all recognize that. And then, so you want to evaluate, uh, you know, all the guys that have a chance to get you to where you want to be. And six months from now, you know, some will be available and some won't, and some will be committed to us. So, you know, it's really more about our numbers and how many scholarships we'll have available, you know, next December and next February. And that's a fluid situation, and we've got X amount of scholarships available today for next year's recruiting class. But that number is always fluctuating. How do you feel about the, the new red shirt rule that, as it was applied this year? You know, I think it's a great rule uh, because uh, <clears throat> take the scenario where maybe you're depleted with injury at the end of the season uh, and you're forced to take a red shirt off a guy uh, to play in one game, and he loses a year of eligibility, and I don't think that's fair. So I think this is a good way to help uh, the players get their feet wet and also retain that extra year of eligibility. I think, I think the NCAA, you know, they got it right on this one. Coach James, you've had success in the past few years using a tight end. Would you talk about Hunter Bullock, what he brings mm -hmm. to the table? And then that area where he lives in the upstate of South Carolina is a really good area for high school football. Yeah, Landing a young man to JMU, does right. that open more doors for you in the upstate? Right, yeah. Well, you know, obviously he was a quality player. Their team went deep into the playoffs. He's had a very successful career at a place that wins a lot of games. That's really good football in the upstate of South Carolina. He's been in the program. He's doing a fantastic job, you know, uh, both in the classroom and in the weight room right now. Um, you know, the tight end position is a little thin uh, com coming in with Dylan Stapleton returning and um, Cheatham, Cheatham. Nick Carlton also, and we have some other players at that position. We've also moved Drew Painter from back to tight end, who was signed originally as a tight end, 
256-pound tight end from central Pennsylvania who went to defensive tackle last year because of numbers. So, you know, Shane likes to use multiple sets and personnel groupings uh, on offense. Uh, there have been years where he's been very successful where they've used a lot of two tight end sets. You know, our first number one personnel grouping will be one tight end, three wides, one back. But we'll be in some two tight end sets and obviously three tight end sets in short yards. So depth at that position is important, especially with number one and number two on the depth chart right now are going to be rising seniors. Bull again, Dorian Davis, their early enrollees. Just kind of what your thoughts is as you've gotten to know him a little bit uh, early mm-hmm. on in the time here. Yeah, well, they're both getting, you know, uh, a lot of compliments about what they're doing in the classroom and down in the weight room and, and the agilities. Uh, you know, we're going to know a lot more about them. Obviously, we start spring ball Thursday, March the 14th. And uh, I think the biggest thing for them is it's a, a great transitional period. Uh, to kind of learn the offense, the defense, to wake up on your own, to go to class. Uh, and so when they come back uh, in August, really they're almost like sophomores now uh, and not freshmen. So uh, it, that's always helped guys enrolling early, and I think it'll be beneficial for them also. Coach, you talk a little about C.J. Jackson. He's a guy who missed his senior year with right. injury, but was obviously a still really good player. And, mm-hmm. and what do you expect to see from him, especially having that year away from football, but to still be part of this class? Yeah, well, you know, he hurt his foot in a seven-on-seven tournament, didn't play his senior year, but he's got blazing speed and quickness. He, he's a guy that can take it 90. He can take it to the house. Uh, he'll be one of the faster players on our team, and now I think our challenge is to keep him out there every day for practice and games and keep him healthy because uh, you can't make the club in the tub, so to speak. And uh, But, you know, that goes for all these guys. We're really excited about him. He's got special talent. Coach, as I look down these uh, numbers here, some that pop out at me, Jalen Green, the defensive lineman from Good Counsel, you talked about that group before, but career sacks record holder there, 38 and a half, 13 as a senior. Those numbers are kind of eye-popping to me. What skill set is permitting him to be this efficient, have all those big numbers that you've seen so far? Yeah, I mean, that that is impressive. 38.5 career sacks, 13 as a senior, all-time leading sack. You know, and it's all about getting to the passer and passing situations. He's got great get-off, and he's relentless. He's a guy we're uh, really excited to see. I, I think he could be a factor. And, uh, you know, like every week he's playing against guys that are signing at Alabama and Syracuse and Georgia and Richmond. and uh, So he's playing against really good competition. Uh, now, for all these guys, it will be a transition. Uh, you know, coming to a place like this, they're going to be competing against really good football players. You know, I'm sure the pace, the tempo, the workload's going to be a little different than high school. And generally the guys that are sort of mature enough to handle that their freshman year are the ones that are able to make significant contributions as freshmen. Coach, we talk about any advantages or maybe challenges to offering a partial scholarship. You do have one of those. Yeah. How does that help this program to, to maybe right. get another young man into the fold you might not have gotten? Yeah. Well, I think when you look at the cost of attendance in-state, for a premier academic institution like JMU, it's a tremendous opportunity. Like I mentioned previous, I do think there's a lot of FCS type players or guys that are really close to being scholarship guys, maybe that just because of numbers don't receive a full scholarship. So I think there's a number of guys in the state like that. You know, we felt really fortunate to get a guy like Kevin Curry uh, in that situation. Uh, you know, our last weekend we had 14 preferred walk-ons on campus. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll add a handful of them to the team in the fall. And, you know, young people, they just develop differently and at different ages. Some people develop a lot between 17 and 18 and some between 19 and 20. And you just don't ever know. You know, it's really not an exact science. There's a little art to it, too. Do you mind to talk about your messaging to, to a recruit, especially as you're approaching, you know, the signing day? Here's what we need, you know, being, how transparent the honesty you have with not only a student athlete but their parents as well about getting a commitment and then sticking with that commitment. Getting a commitment and sticking with it? Yeah, yeah. what your message is to a, to a recruit. Well, I, I, you know, I, I'm not one to beat around the bush. I mean, you know, we're going to win a lot of football games here. And we have won a lot of football games and a lot of championships. And, and our vision is to take this thing to another level in terms of we've won one, we want to unseat – the team out west and we want to win our conference year in year out those are the goals so i haven't met anyone yet that that had a negative experience at jmu 
Uh, everyone that's going to school loves it. There's tremendous fan support, and, you know, there's tremendous resources. So our brand, you know, I've had a number of high school coaches in the state tell me we have the strongest brand in the state. I believe we do, too. When you look at, from a football academic standpoint, the total package. So um, I think the whole key then is just getting them up here on the official visit because seeing is believing, right? And uh, so I think it's an easy sell. I think, like I said before, I think the biggest thing is, is choosing the right guys. Well, you know, there's uh, there's certain do's and don'ts, obviously, and I think the guys, all the guys in our program, know the difference between right and wrong, and we just want to put our best foot forward and, you know, show these guys a good time, a good quality time, and know when to say yes and when to say no, and uh, our guys do a tremendous job of representing, you know, the institution and the football program. Thank you very much.